Chris Hipkins started 2023 by becoming Labour leader and Prime Minister and ended it as opposition leader. He joins me to talk about the year that was and the year to come. Well, let, let's talk about 2023. Um, clearly not a good year for Labour in terms of the election result. Um, you faced a big challenge from the very start and then when, when you took over as Prime Minister, but polls lifted. I, I just wonder, when you look back, do you wonder what might have been had you not lost four ministers within the space of a few months? Do you I certainly think that that didn't help, but I don't think that that was ultimately the cause of our election defeat. When I became Prime Minister, I was, I guess, realistic. You know, that the, there was a pathway to victory for us. We could win the election, but it was a fairly narrow path and it did re result, you know, it did need a lot of things to go in our favour in order for that to happen. And unfortunately, a lot of things didn't go in our favour. I think we have to, you know, we do have to consider the election result in the context of the full six years that we were in government. You know, we faced a huge number of challenges during that time. And I think that by the time the election rolled around, there was a mood for change in the country. And I acknowledge that. I respect that. Um, and I don't know that there was much that we could have done to shift that. We certainly tried. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, I well, think people I, just wanted something different. I wonder, in a sense, was your COVID response, which got you that 2020 election result, but then effectively one of the things that became a negative. I certainly think that the 2020 and the 2023 elections can kind of be seen as bookends to the country's COVID response, really. In 2020, we were just getting underway with the, the COVID response, and there was huge support for what we were doing. And I think that the big result that we got was, uh, was clearly a mandate for us to continue doing what we were doing on the COVID front. Uh, and then by 2023, I think people were well and truly over it. And the cost of what we were doing, you know, in, back in 2020, 2021, was also more apparent as well. You know, we knew that there was going to be a cost for what we were doing uh, around elimination. I still think that that was a, a price worth paying. So when I look at our response relative to other countries around the world, when I look at the overall outcome of what we achieved, I think that we got the balance about right. We had <clears throat> fewer people in New Zealand dying from COVID than just about any, any other country in the world. But also, and this is a bit that people I think do forget, we actually had more freedom than most other places around the world as well, unless you wanted to travel internationally, in which case there was certainly a lot of constraint on that. But we had fewer lockdown days than, you know, if you think about the UK, you think about some of the states in the US who were doing lockdown, some weren't. I mean, the US is a complicated picture. R across Europe, uh, even across the Tasman in Australia, in many cases they were doing more long lockdowns for longer than we did it here in New Zealand. And, but in terms of your policy programme, and, and Labor faced a lot of criticism around execution, but I th particularly given COVID, did you remain too ambitious for too long in terms of the other stuff you tried to do? I, I think we, um, we had a very busy work programme, and the problem is, I think one of the problems for us was that our work programme continued to grow during the time we were in government, and we perhaps weren't as... Um, uh, strategic and saying, OK, well, if, we, if we're having to pick up new things because of circumstances, because of events, we need to drop some things off. We tried to do too much all at the same time. And I, I think I recognised that when I became Prime Minister. We did look to thin down the government's work programme to something that was more manageable and more realistic. But some of those bigger long-term uh, reform programmes that we had were certainly disrupted by COVID-19. So I think about some of the things we were doing in education, for example. Um, we basically had three years in the education portfolio, not six, because there was three years taken out of the middle with COVID. And trying to do any reform in, say, the schooling sector, when teachers and principals were saying, look, we're just trying to survive from one day to the next, was clearly impossible. So progress really stalled on a lot of big things during that time. And I don't think... You know, it was it was a hard thing for the government to grapple with because no one knew when the pandemic started <clears throat> that it was going to go on for three yeah. years. So you can't say, oh, we're going to put all that on hold for three years on the basis, you know, that we know it's going to be three years. It could have been six months. Um, and in, in reality, the fact that the pandemic went on for three years or the effects of the pandemic went on for three years, I think, was one of the things that, that really caused us quite a headache. I mean... From the, the left of politics, you got whacked too, over, particularly over tax, capital gains tax and or wealth tax. And, and it seemed to be because you made the supposed captain's call, even though your predecessor, Jacinda Ardern, had ruled it out anyway. I mean, what, where does that stand now as an issue for Labor? 
we, we do have to, as a country, be honest about our tax system. Our tax system is creaking at the edges and it's not going to actually be fit for purpose long into the future. So if you look at the changing nature of the workforce, for example, PAYE is likely to be a diminishing pool of uh, income for the government because there are fewer people, there will be proportionately fewer people paying PAYE as the economy changes, as people move into different forms of employment, different um, ways of, of organising themselves. We're going to have to think about what that means for the tax system. And that's going to have to happen regardless of who the government is, whether it's a centre-left government or a centre-right government. We actually need to be upfront and honest with Kiwis about that. And there are some inequities in the way our tax system operates. The fact that, you know, if, if you are a first home buyer and you do manage to get your, you know, your foot on the property ladder, the fact that your house can sometimes earn more in a year than you earn from your salary and wages, I think everyone can see that that's not sustainable. So we have to think about not just the tax system, but actually the overall kind of economic system that creates that environment. Well, in that context, then, I presume you're disappointed that the government has scrapped the, the tax principles reporting act. I am because there's no real point to scrapping it unless they don't want transparency around the tax system. I think the Tax Principles Act really does one thing. It increases transparency. It says, okay, you know, this is what, this is where, the, this is where tax is collected. This is who's paying it. This is where it's going. Um, and actually gives people better information to make decisions. I, I think, you know, it's, it's a bit like the um, Fiscal Responsibility Act that Ruth Richardson passed, only it's looking at the revenue side of it rather than the expenditure side. So looking to 2024 as opposition, what are your priorities for the year? I think we have to do three things in opposition, and it will be across the three years, and so starting in 2024, I think we have to be a strong and effective opposition. You know, I, I'm firmly of the view that if you want a promotion, you have to do a good job of the job you've got now. We want a promotion three years from now, so that means we have to do a good job of the one that we've got, which is to be a very good opposition, and we will do that. And when we look at the weakness of the current government, you know, they they are they have so many different positions. They have three parties that make up the government, and they seem to come up with ten different positions on on issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So we have a, an important job to do there in holding them to account. We also need to make sure that we're on the positive side of that as well. I don't want to be an opposition that just barks at every passing car. I think it's too easy to fall into that trap when you're in opposition. So we need to make sure we're using this time to think and to reflect and to come up with new ideas and be better prepared when we come back into government in three years' time, which is, of course, the goal. And then finally, you know, as, as a really important sort of third component of that, that listening, that reflecting, that rebuilding of the broader Labour movement is also really important. The longer you're in government, the more you tend to find that support base starts to uh, need a bit more attention. And we're certainly in that position at the moment. Well, with the government scrapping things like fair pay agreements and a few other initiatives that, you know, were, were Labour's, do you think that's going to help, if you like, um, strengthen... Labour support? I think what New Zealanders who voted for change are seeing is that they're getting a change but it's not necessarily the change they thought they were voting for. I think they thought, thought they were voting for sort of a continuation of, uh, of many things um, in, in the way that if you like the, the key government continued much of what happened under the Clark government, the Ardern government continued much of what happened under the key government. Um, what we're seeing now is something entirely different, which is a government that actually really wants to wind the clock backwards. And uh, I don't think that that's what New Zealanders had in mind when they voted for change. So you're, you're confident that you've got a real chance of getting back in power in three years? A absolutely. And I think the, the, the terrible start, the, the shambolic start, in fact, that this government has had um, means that I think they're going to struggle to make it through three years. And they're certainly not going to provide the strong, stable government that's almost become an embarrassing catchphrase for them because they, on a day-to-day -day basis, New Zealanders can see they're delivering anything but. So what, you're preparing for the possibility of an early election? Well, look, I said uh, at, well before the election that any government that involved Winston Peters and David Seymour was going to be a recipe for instability. We're already seeing that now, so who knows what might happen. Chris Hipkins, thank you for your time. For more content just like this and all the latest business and political news, head over to nbr.co.nz.